Yeah, because I'm, I'm, I was a teacher at Yale, and I teach now at Brooklyn College, and those are very different. Mm -hmm. But I would um, like to support something you say in a way, just to be honest. Um, if you look at a, a book of black art history, self-representation is presented as the project du jour. And like, if you look at who the most successful black artists of our generation are, it's going to be Nicolin Thomas and Kahende and, and self-representation, etc. And when I travel, you know, as a visiting artist or whatever, all over the country, it seems like the young black artists who are kind of in the know know that self-representation is the way to go in order to be successful. That's my, my, my you know, experience. And the ones who are like, you know, they're going to just do this abstract expressionism, they kind of know that nobody is going to want to see their work. I mean, that's just from, because they look at our history book and that's what pictures tell. <laughs> but I also have, I also have my male students now who are interested in their identity as this kind of invisible violence, like the idea that they can't get arrested, like the idea of this, you know, and somebody wrote an article about this idea of, you know, never being profiled and kind of wanting to be <laughs> and, and I don't think that in you know, 2030, the solution is not that we're all going to be unmarked artists. The solution is that we're all going to be marked artists. Like they're just, you know, we aren't going to all be privileged, like nobody will be privileged. But I, I do see young white artists being becoming young white male artists becoming interested in um, making their identity visible somehow. I, I'm sure that the establishment will, will not reward them just like it does not reward a black female abstract expressionist. But you know, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Sure. television shall call the whitest kid you know. So you know, I just want to I just want to kind of uh, you know I think you're right. Um, but I don't think that those, I think those are social, real social pressures. That I don't think they, you know, the, the, the question starting at, at is does this come out of the university? Is if I'm, is if I'm uh, going, yeah. walking around, rounding up all the brown people and telling them that they have to make identity work. And I don't think that is true. I think what's true about what you're saying is that those are real social, the, the, the influence, the temptation of, of, of looking at what is successful, what, what the, uh, artwork seem, seemingly wants or supposedly wants because they're they're highlighted in, in, in magazines or in reviews or any of this thing is very tempting for for um, artists across, you know young artists across the board. That's a, that's a social pressure. It doesn't come out of a, you know a teaching strategy. I just want to say that what what's your name? Mike. Michael. Mike is describing it's like a it's sort of a bait and switch kind of operation. Like you you say. All right, you're black. You can make work about being black. People like that. People want to see it. You know, academics like that. It's like all kinds of subject matter. And then you you put yourself in a marked category. You you put yourself in an economic niche that has a ceiling. I know. Is that true? I, I know. That's what I think. I but I'll say one last thing about um, identity art in in school. Because what I see with teachers in graduate school is like, okay, if you're black and gay and you're making work about that, they kind of leave you alone. <laughs> and with white boys, it's like if you're making geometric abstraction, they leave you alone. So it's like geometric abstraction is that equivalent. <laughs> One of the things that's true about the art landscape now is you hardly ever see a white artists making art about black people. Like, yeah, I just really think you didn't like the show. I mean, tell me if I'm wrong. I think maybe I did. you didn't like the show. Rather <laughs> than, but I'm just kind of, I guess like the kind of, in a way, I think, um, I think it would have been better to, or I would have been interested in you criticizing the work of the show and not feeling, which it seemed to be a little bit, some kind of pressure or guilt no, no, to no. talk about it. I didn't get I so, felt. It came out of exasperation. I mean, I, to me, these whole this discourse is stalled. I mean, I, I love what Mike's saying. I mean, you know, in a, in a generation, the, the, the white folks are going to be in the minority in this country. So, you know, uh, we have that to look forward to. And then, then I'll get a, a Guggenheim grant. <laughs> <laughs>
Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I would like to know why the establishment, possibly why the establishment is rewarding um, black identity art. Um, is it not because it keeps us more separate? I mean, you know, more separate. because it will, it's, it will keep us more, sep more separation <coughs> between the race because uh, it makes you different. I'm not sure that the white establishment is a white black identity art. I mean, I think that we are again maybe oversimplifying a little bit. Um, I mean, I can think of a lot of artists of color who are not making identity art, who are very successful, you know, Paul Pfeiffer, Julie Mary too. Who are Pfeiffer is about? Sam Gilliam. Well, yeah. I think that very um, question that you asked leads to the question of why do we still need um, these solidarity shows? Um, because there are artists, and I had the experience, I guess about six to seven months ago, going to MoMA to the Abstract Expressionist show. Did anyone go to see that show? And which was extraordinary. And there was a black artist who was part of that movement and who was very much part of the conversation. Martin and I Lewis. went in to the room where his work was being shown, and they had two tiny pieces on the wall, and I almost burst into tears. And his name was Norman Lewis. Norman. And I thought, well, why is he relegated to a tiny corner? It's because at the time when Momo was purchasing the art, they didn't place value on him. And it was all about identity politics. And so I think that when you have corrective shows like Now Dig This, it's about excavating these artists who, over the course of you know, 20, 30 years, were relegated to the margins of sort of art history because their work wasn't deemed valuable by the white establishment. It's, it's, even, more, it's even a little bit more complicated than that because, you know, as Kelly, you know, uh, said, uh, Conversation with her. A lot of those artists are in, in, in very big museum collections, they, but they're not on the wall. Yes. And so, when you, this idea of excavating, <laughs> like, let's say excavating instead of directing, right? Because that's that's not that's better. Right? That's a better word. I think that's that that tells a story. It tells a richer story of of art, and I think that that is attract. I mean, I think but, but there's a place for that. There's what about, the, what about the hundreds, I'm sure, of uh, second, third, fourth tier white artists making assemblage in Los Angeles in the, mm -hmm. in the 60s? Don't they, do they deserve, I mean, well, I know that the, the key, I think thing, the reason for paying attention to these artists is that they're black. Well, no, they but they, but because, because they are major um, collections and, and, and institutions around the country that um, are underrepresenting them. They're not, they weren't there. I mean, they're not there like in, in collections of, of museums around the country. They're, they are people who are were in an important conversation, an important conversation at the time. I'm a student um, of art criticism and writing at the School of Visual Arts, and as you probably can imagine, we're discussing your article quite a lot of controversy in class. And, um, well, I wanted to break it down to the major questions that came up where um, what is integrity and what is the responsibility and what are the instances of self-criticism for an art critic? And I would like to ask you, like, basically for all my class, um, especially when addressing young art critics, what do you think and what is the responsibility for art criticism for you and what kind of responsibilities do art critics have and what are your instances for self-criticism, and in how far do you follow them? I, I think my responsibility is to, to, to uh, put into words my experience of art, or any particular art, as, as honestly and truly as I can. My self-criticism is to reread it and say, do I really think this? Is this really true? And uh, was there more than a question? Well, I mean, so I would ask you, do you, do you think that you really think this, what you wrote? <laughs> <laughs> I think I think it, yeah. <laughs> Is there a part that you... Uh... I mean, I, I may have, like, compressed it in a way that made it hard for some people to follow, but I, you know, I still stand by it. Um, I just want to make an observation. There's a lot of 
sort of levels of polarizing going on, and some people have mentioned, you know, you're all ganging up on Ken, you know, he's one guy and you're this group who are disagreeing. But what I really feel as a polarizing thing is that the rest of you are all in academia. And I did not go to graduate school, and I consider myself a very, you know, like a, a real artist. You know, I didn't go to graduate school, and that's okay. You know, I didn't need to, it's like all these questions about what you learn in school, what you're pressured to do in school. All of that stuff is bullshit. You know, you need to find your own subject matter. And if you're going to school and they're telling you you need to make identity art, and that's not what you want to make art about, What's your name? the hell with that. What's your name? Orianne Stender. Oh, just for that. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, it's just, I, I, you know, I don't want to like say you guys are all full of shit because you're academic, academics, but. I think this whole like MFA mill is, it's a scam, you know, it's like a, it's a self-perpetuating thing because, you know, you may have this great exhibition record and be in museums and stuff, but you can't get a job teaching if you don't have that MFA. And of course there's a reason for that because if you go to graduate school and your teacher did not go to graduate school, you're going, well, wait a minute, maybe I don't need to be in graduate school. I, go ahead. I'm talking about, I'm not talking about me grouping other people, I'm talking about people grouping themselves. And, and I also think this, and this hasn't come up yet, this is all about power. I mean, uh, I Control. think we need to not introduce this idea that forget about quality and art, we don't know what it is, uh, and the people who are in charge, who the winners are the ones who get to uh, establish the measures of quality, so therefore we should forget about them and the whole field of art is just politics. And the winners will be those who can exert their group identity most strongly, loudly, and loudly. And that's like... And in this society, who would that be? <laughs> well, she was up against, she's talking about taking, I mean, she's a kind of, well, I think she's, she's, she's about talking about taking down the white, you know, yeah. the hierarchy, the hegemony. And, uh, but, but what do you what do you get? But what do you get from that? If that becomes like what art is about, I then, shouldn't. I then, think you shouldn't well, sorry, sorry, sorry. That's all sorry. right. I'm mis. I'm maybe wrong, but but I think a lot of people take that to be like art is like actually a tool for politics. It is. I don't necessarily valorize what I call deracinated formalist invention. My point was that is what's valorized. Mm -hmm. yeah. Can we take this yeah, guy's yeah, yeah. And the, the and, and so these <laughs> these black artists in LA took up assemblage and then marked it, and that automatically discounts it. it. Not for me necessarily, but for the, you know in the art world that we have, we may change. Somebody else jump in. Okay. Uh, I, I have a comment and two questions. My comment is, first of all, that uh, I just want to point out that in putting that show in the New York Times, which didn't have to happen, Ken was making a positive statement as any of the hundreds of artists who've never gotten a review in the New York Times can tell you. And, and there's much more to say about that, but I won't go into that. The term sloppy and rigorous has come up a lot, and I just want to point out two things and ask questions there. One, how is it that this panel got put together with such extreme on one side and only Ken on the other? That's sloppy. <laughs> second, second, there's a statement that was made at the beginning, this is meant to not be censorship, but talk about things that are unacceptable. Somebody needs to define what that is. Because to me, if you can't talk about something, that's kind of the definition of censorship. And lastly, when you talk about what Ken missed in his review, which, you know, at 500 words, he missed most of it, as anyone who's ever tried to write will test, he missed most of it. So, so my question is, 
when you wrote the statement, which is I thought what we were also going to be talking about was the open letter, how is it that there was no talking about what was good about the show? It was all about Ken. Here was this opportunity to have a dialogue about what Ken missed. And instead, it was a criticism of what Ken said. I know nothing more about the show after reading your open letter than I did before I read Ken's review, which to me was a complete waste of space. You're all talking about what Ken should have said, what Ken should have said, what Ken should have said. What did you say? No. It's a question. <laughs> <laughs> What was important about the show that Ken missed? Where's that dialogue? Well, before the people, so before the people who wrote the letter address that, I I think that this discussion was not to re-critique the show. But let me organize and talk about this. I think it was. So it was about the I, themes that were covered. In the I think it's my turn now. <laughs> I I think that what it was about was to because it sparked so much confusion and anger and debate about race that we would continue that discussion to ask Ken questions about what he meant by certain things. So that's one thing. To answer another part of this, I don't know what you mean by you saying there's all of us and there's them. <laughs> to me, to me that's saying, oh you've got like um, I what does that mean? Um you've got more minorities on the side of the room than not. No, no, we have no, more no. academics on the What no. does that mean? We are all, I'm going to say this again, we all, most of us have worked with Ken, we're colleagues of Ken, we're in the same circle of interested, like I said, in the concept, a petition of against ideas him of, to bring of ideas down. in art. Be honest, for Christ's sake. So that's for my point. Nice well, 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 can I just say <laughs> the open letter, and I think it would be good now if both of them would speak, and we'll start with Anuka. Sure. I, I wanted to say that um, the open letter was a consensus among five authors who wrote it, and it doesn't, you know, so it represents a range of viewpoints, and it was meant to be a consensus where people were, who were dismayed, people who were outraged could find voice that was denied voice in the Times. Um, Ken was published in the Times. We didn't have that platform, so we chose um, the space. Our our motivation was to get a public response in print from the Times. Many people had written individual letters and had not received response, and nothing could be printed in the Times. Our motivation was not to take Ken down. Ken down. I mean, I corresponded with Ken personally, um, you know, in, in, in small ways, um, because I it was important for me. Um, that this wasn't personal. This was about the times. This is about um, questions of editorial rigor and, 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 and open conversation, not about shutting down the speech. Um, you know, <laughs> yeah, so it was very important for me to have com compassion and empathy. I mean, I, I, there were moments during this whole thing where you know, I could look back, hindsight is 2020, and realize how things could have been worded or framed better. I don't think the open letter is the final word. It clearly isn't. I think this panel says it. It's not a perfect document. And I, you know, I felt compassion for Ken because, you know, once it's out there, it's out there. And he probably felt the same way when his review got published. And so, you know, I just think it's really important that we keep this, we humanize each other and not sort of like fall into the trap of, of flattening each other into flat characters. And because I had an issue with what Ken wrote and because I said something publicly about that does not make me the PC lynch mob or the witch hunt. It just makes me a person with ideas who many people share. And I found a forum, we found a forum to articulate them. So, you know, I, I, you know, I think that's, that's the way I approach this. Well, I, I, I don't, I, I don't really want it all to be about me, but I, since the, the words rigorous and sloppy have been popular, I think anybody who reads that open letter would sort of wonder about the rigorous and neat, rigorousness and neatness of it. In my, in my feeling reading it, and I only read it once because it was just sort of hurt my head, but. Um, it completely misrepresented what I wrote and was factually incorrect. 
So I thought, well, you know, you should have your ducks in a row if you're going to, you know. Because it starts, as I recall, by saying that I started by saying black artists didn't invent assemblage, which is the sentence that comes like halfway through the review. Now, you know, it's, it is set. That's, so, you know. And it wasn't even the point. Right. So, so I, I just think, you know, I can't, you know, that's like, uh, when did you stop meeting your wife? I mean, I can't, I, I do the best I can. I'm not perfect. I think that, uh, you know, I don't know if anybody here has any idea what it's like to work on deadline week after week and, and how, you know, uh, but that's not an excuse. I still don't think what I wrote is that sloppier or unrigorous, but you know, it's not for me to say. I, if somebody thinks it is, I'll, I, you know, I'm not about criticism. I think the, the, the idea was that, uh, to give, like I said, to give kind of expression to um, people who were feeling pretty angry, uh, thinking about the, the article in many ways and having a kind of a rich discussion and pushing forward. Also, writing letters to the New York Times and coming up to a kind of a kind of, a kind of a pressure. I don't even like Facebook or being on it that much, but all of a sudden I was like, you know, on Facebook for like a month, really, and we talking about this with a lot of people, and people checking in and saying, did, did anybody publish it? Did anybody publish it? And there were like at least 20 people who wrote something um, to the editors, and that, so, so what I found was that it was pretty clear, it was a pretty clear that this was going to be a one-way conversation. And this is how these things kind of always, always plays out. And it's not necessarily Ken's fault, but the New York Times as, a, as, a, as an institution has a way of fixing um, uh, certain notions about, um, um, say, like this, this type of show. Is it divisive? I mean, I, I think you kind of felt like it had divided people. Um, and that's a real debate. But that's a debate that doesn't get that, that didn't have a voice necessarily. It's a one-sided debate, um, and under understanding that that wasn't going to happen, I think that people wanted to do something in which to voice some some opinion, which is collectively get together and have something that a, a letter to the New York Times to, to hopefully sort of be published or or make a, a particular debate. I agree that not all of those. You, you, you know, maybe there, I would agree, maybe there was maybe some ineloquence in the letter, um, as all of this is extremely organic. But I do think that um, the point of the letter was to take not Ken to task, but the points in, in, the, uh, in the article, um, which rang uh, uh, problematic for a lot of people. And I, think, I do think that it successfully did that. I think, uh, you know, the, the overall gist of the article is that in the face of real sort of social inequity, that the onus or to, to um, you know, of, 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 that, of that problem is put upon the artist and not the sort of high end art world that doesn't really truly get critiqued in that article. Um, and, I, and so that, so, so I think that needed, that opinion needed to be, to be voiced. Politics and art is kind of reductive, if you don't mind me saying so. Also, I was a white male in LA during this period, and I made terrific paintings, as I'm still making, and uh, you know, I couldn't get on the radar. And there were a lot of terrific people there at the same time who never you know, made the cut or got noticed or whatever. So this notion that, uh, and the solidarity, again, living in LA, there was all sorts of, as Ken said, but, uh, you know, it's past my bedtime. What's, what I don't want to go unexamined again or repeated was how vicious the attack was. Maybe not intended to be as vicious, but it was intended from my point of view as, as a petition, not a conversation. It was bullying, it was incendiary, and it was meant to bring Ken Johnson down. And it was unsigned. And it was unsigned. 
and there was, the, can I just say what I'm, because again, I'm, I'm an expert, you know, I called Ken up, because I got the petition before he did, and I told him about it. So let's not pretend that this was an attempt to create conversation. Now it's interesting, it is creating conversation. It's interesting and it's creating an interesting conversation. But that's beside the point. Ken's got an, but what, can I just speak? You've spoken. Ken's got a long history of writing about art for many, many years. Writing about very minority kind of uh, artists and all sorts of artists across the board. And Ken doesn't need my defense. He's doing great tonight. The way you've set this thing up is outrageous, as has been mentioned by Devin and others. But the, the point is that Ken has a history. So you couldn't bring him down, even if you, even if you intended to bring him down, because he's written about everybody, including Adrian Piper, and he happens to be Adrian Piper's favorite critic. So again, his, he's got unimpeachable bona fides, and to trivialize what he does in that piece or any piece is just disrespectful and uh, uncollegial, and to see artists trying to shut up other artists even in this kind of sort of so-called civilized way of writing a letter to the New York Times, to me is, you know, it, it, it smacks of McCarthyism and all sorts of things that are terrifying to me. Well, I, I know, again, I didn't write the letter, but I, I really, I, I have to say, you know, I'm going to say this now, and I'm going to point so aggressively and characterize, again, all of us as one group. Well, did you read the letter? Did you okay. sign the of course position? I read the letter. Yeah. I, but I'm saying I didn't write the letter. Okay. And you I came it, right? here. I'm just going to tell you from my point of view because okay. I really, it's a little, it feels a little hostile what's going on right now. I, I would like to, I would like to be one of the people that could possibly so, speak to Ken's, okay. the support so of I Ken Johnson. I am in complete support of Ken Johnson. You don't and sound because, like. It. No, he knows I am. Do you not know? You don't sound <laughs> <laughs> like you. <laughs> you don't sound like okay, I mean, so respectfully, I say that. Speak, respectfully, okay, I'm sorry. I feel because it takes some courage, take and I and I have had debates about work. We, you know, we work together. I think it takes some courage for me to come and say, you know, Ken, in this one piece you wrote, let me finish. Yeah. In this one piece you wrote, as far as I consider what I consider, a, this is how I start, what I consider a critic's job to be, and based on a, a more global conversation within the art world right now about the role of criticism and where it's failing, but I think I should be given permission in this forum Absolutely. to say, Ken, I think, sorry, you don't like the word, or a bit sloppy here. And, and, and the ways I think he was a bit sloppy are the following. I'm going to articulate them as my closing statement here, OK? <laughs> I think a critic has some responsibility to look at history. You know, because if you're going to talk about a assemblage, I think you need to take it from way it was used as a kind of um, political tool for art making within the show, back to Dada, as Ken did, maybe even back further than that. I also think <coughs> Ken has a responsibility to use language politely. Okay, and there's so a critic, let, let there me, is I no responsibility. No, I think there's He's an entertainer. <laughs> it's the New York so Times. Crazy. Who the fuck wants to read art criticism unless it's lively? There are certain That's terms that are, are racially insulting, or could be. And I think Ken, it's okay. I think Ken's a big boy. I understand that some people may have taken offense by some of the terms. One of them I happen to point out. And then finally, I also think there's a responsibility by critics um, to look. And, I, and, and to address an audience. And I actually think in this one situation, Ken did look hard enough at the work, and I would say, I don't know what his audience was. 